It started with a lineup on a trumped up charge and ended with a reveal and explosions on a barge. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 14 of Talking Pictures Alliance, where today Jeff and I are going to be talking about the usual suspects, 1995's sleeper hit, maybe cult classic. I've heard it referred to in many ways. What are you, what are your thoughts? I think it, I mean, I think it's pretty well known this now. I mean, I guess sleeper hit would have been a would have been a way a good way of describing it uh, previously, like in 1995. But man. Good movie. Mm -hmm. Very enjoyable. One of those movies where it's got an ending that blows your mind. Maybe people expected it. Maybe people didn't. But the basic plot is that it follows a group of gangsters, thieves. I guess thieves is a better term. Ocean's Eleven kind of a thing. Five guys that are accused of something they didn't do, maybe. And then they all get together and plan big heist. And suddenly at the end of the movie, you find out 27 people died. And a cop's trying to figure out who did it, why they did it. And what exactly happened. And I think by the end, none of the audience knows exactly what happened. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. They never, uh, yeah, they never really show what exactly happened. It's just implied at the, at the very, very, very end. But talking about this movie, I mean, this might be a movie that you haven't seen out there if you're listening to this. I mean, it, it's definitely a lot of people know about this movie. A lot of people know that it's a good film and all of this stuff. But when I was talking to some of my buddies and just saying that we were watching this movie next, some people d hadn't seen it. And so if you haven't seen it out there, pause the podcast, go watch the movie. I mean, it, it's good. And it's it's well done, and I guess it has that 90s movie feel. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I know exactly what you mean, because we're talking about director Brian Singer. And if you don't know who Brian Singer is, he is basically the X-Men director. I didn't know he had handled all of the X-Men except for the third one, pretty much. But he directed the first one, which was very 90s. The second one, which was, you know, 90s-ish. Uh, Days of Future Past and then Apocalypse. So it's interesting to see that he went from such a realistic thievery film to comic book stuff. And that's really all he's kind of done. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know that either until you wrote that down and I was reading the, the notes on the show. And I thought it's really interesting. You know, I... There's a lot of directors out there. If you go back and you look at like the not the super famous directors, I'm not talking about like Steven Spielberg and, and directors like that, but directors like Brian Singer, who you go back and you can see where their career really took off. Right. And so the usual suspect is, is a perfect example of that. And maybe that fueled, you know, him to go on and do all of these other hit movies that are out there. But yeah, it's super interesting to look at that. I, I spend a lot of time like, oh, where did this director get their start? And then you look at their that movie and you go, oh, yeah, that that's where it really took off. Exactly. And it's not like he had a long list prior to The Usual Suspects either. I think he had one or two other credits to his directorial name. But that was the one that really sold it. And apparently the story goes that Kevin Spacey had seen something that Brian Singer and then writer Christopher McQuarrie had done together. And he came up to those two and he goes, look, the next film you do, I'm in it. And the usual suspects started coming together. Uh, Christopher McQuarrie, the writer, s saw a picture of a lineup of of bad guys and went, OK, so what happened? How did all five of these guys end up together? And then got the ball rolling on that one. And other credits to McQuarrie's name include films I think both of us really enjoy. Jack Reacher, Edge of Tomorrow, Mission Impossible, Rogue Nation, basically the modern Tom Cruise story writer. <laughs> Yes, I'm in guilty pleasure Tom Cruise movies, but I'm saying uh, right place, right time. So much of Hollywood is that right. If you look at it and you just see these stories like Kevin Spacey going out there, fighting these two guys, watching a film, liking it, saying, hey, we need to make a movie together. And then them saying, OK, well, what would it be about? And just rolling like that and then becoming an Oscar winning film like The Usual Suspects. 
it's crazy to think about how some of this stuff gets started. Right. And how insane to be an up and coming director, writer and Kevin Spacey, who is established at this time in 95, comes to you and says, let's work together. You're not going to say no to that. You're, ju- you're going to jump on it all together. And you're right. I had no idea this film had garnered Academy Awards, much less two, because the writer was awarded an Academy Award. And Kevin Spacey also was awarded Best Supporting Actor for this film. Yeah. I I, I was looking through all the Academy nominations for this year and all of that kind of stuff, just kind of putting it on on a playing field to see where it was at. Where, so where and was I it? Think, who, who else was up against this film? There there was a bunch of other stuff. It was a while since I looked at it, but I can look at it right now. But I'm, I'm thinking... It, it was just the movie is really good, but it is a little bit campy or cheesy yes. in some aspects, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. Some of the camera shots, the slow-mo fall of the coffee mug at the end, the zoom in on all of the things that Kevin Spacey used to tell this elaborate tale. It would that's pretty 90s. <laughs> But it's endearing in a way, right? Because it's a a visual storytelling thing that's really kind of stuck to the 90s and doesn't really go beyond that. Yeah, and I think that uh, it fits. It works. I mean, when I watch this, the first thing I start thinking about is I start thinking about you know, a uh, law and order, you know, when law and order is, is got that same kind of look, that same kind of feel, you know, and uh, it really, I mean, that was a hit back then. That was what everybody was watching on TV. So it is what the people wanted uh, when they went out and, and started watching these movies. And so it really hit the mark. Totally. Now, this film is interesting in that we have a very nonlinear story. You don't really know what's going on until the end of the movie because you start and it's yesterday. And then we go back in time for a bit. And then we come back to present time where the story starts to take place. And you don't really know who the characters are. You kind of get to know them as you're trying to weave together this plot. How do you think that worked overall clearly it was a hit clearly everyone enjoyed it but how do you make that feasible without losing all semblance of a story yeah i think it does a really good job i think we talked about this before one of my friends is a writer for hbo and he he writes you know And it's also a fascinating process that we don't as, you know, as just consumers of these films, we don't understand that it takes, you know, it may say that this film is written by so-and-so, but really it takes rooms of writers and runners and more writers and people, you know, drafts and drafts and drafts. It's crazy to think about, right? So uh, I was talking to him a, a little bit about that and about writing and things. And one of the things that he says that they try to stray away from are flashbacks because they seem to be lazy storytelling, right? So if I'm sitting at a coffee table with you and I have to actually explain to you what happened in this situation rather than having me say, it all happened five years ago. <laughs> And now we're suddenly five years ago and can just show what happened. That's what his point is. But I don't feel that it's super lazy in this movie, in The Usual Suspects. When I was watching it, and now that you know that, you're going to start seeing that you watch films like that, thinking, could they have told that by just saying it instead of showing it? But I think that a lot of the stuff in The Usual Suspects feels authentic when they go back in time or when they're changing. And they do it often enough that it doesn't just feel like a montage or a flashback. Yeah, it's one of those where as we jump from past to present, it feels like they're constantly moving the plot forward. There's never a moment in this film where I feel it gets stuck because we're seeing the same thing being told in the past and in the present. For instance, Fenster's death, Del Toro's character, it was great because we didn't see the heist. We knew it was already going to be dangerous. And here he is dead already, as we were promised by um, uh, Kobayashi. Mm-hmm. That, you know, so and so we're seeing the fallout, the plot's already pushed forward, and now we're seeing what we need to see, which is what's bringing us closer to the ship scene, which is, you know, the penultimate end of the movie. What happened? What truly happened? What do, what do we think happened kind of a thing? 
Yeah. So that kind of segues into one of my questions, which is when you watched this film for the first time, Kristen, did you predict the outcome of the movie? Did you think that it could be a uh, that it could have been Kevin Spacey's character? That was the bad guy all along. No, I was totally on the ride from start to finish. I don't think I was trying to predict because in all honesty, it was so intense to try and follow what even the heck was going on that I had no time to sit there and try and come up with what the ending was going to be. It was just so busy and so fast. And the time, the movie length speaks to this. It's it's not even two hours long. It's only an hour of 48 which is great to me because I see that and I go, wow, this is going to be a contained fast story. Boom, 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 boom. There's not going to be much fat. Go for the ride. Have fun and see what you think when you get to the end. Yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree. It, it also it lends itself to that, you know, extended episode of law and order you know that like that extended kind of feel of something that people were really looking for then in 1995 and i think that uh it's the perfect length i didn't feel that it was too long i didn't feel that it was too short it didn't drag it and i think we're used to films being three hours you know two and a half hours you know sitting down and taking a weekend off to watch a movie but i think that this one is really just like you said it's condensed it's got this just a great story that plays over just the right amount of time now did you predict spacey being soze at the end i did i do remember seeing this quite a while ago and thinking uh, i think that some of it is overdone a little bit and what i mean by that is they're showing the guy at the very beginning of the film they show the flashback of how uh the one main guy uh what's his name i forget but how he dies right they're showing his murder and how this person murdered him and they focus on so much of the you know he's walking And he's walking really slow and meticulously. And then when he gets there, he pulls out the lighter and he flips the lighter open and he lights a cigarette. Right. And so at the moment you're thinking, okay, like they're not going to show us. This is going to be like a twist in the end. But then they kind of poke at it with Kevin Spacey where he's sitting in the, uh, the detective's office and he wants a cigarette. Right. And he pulls out a lighter and he like, fumbles the lighter and it like drops on the ground that's something that really was a moment for me i remember and watching it again i remembered it as i was watching it thinking i think they might be giving away too much here like i think they might be you know it's playing too hard at the point that he's not this guy so hard that you know uh, he's got to be the guy I don't think you're wrong there because on the second watching, I was like, it's so obvious from the get go. How could no one pick up on this? But I didn't pick up on it. But yeah, on subsequent viewings, it it's very clear that he was set up as Soze from the beginning with with little things too, cuts. And then when we um, where he is, where he isn't the fact he could he could have been somewhere else but because we assume he's crippled in a sense he couldn't have done that kind of a thing but is it all a lie all of that and that's great and i think that is really chalked up to kevin spacey's performance and i think his performance is just so good that that alone points to him being so from the beginning he, he just blows everyone else out of the water and not that everyone else did a poor job they were all great but Spacey is just swimming pools ahead of everybody else in the the acting swim race that they're competing in. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, even uh, like I have the Oscar nominees pulled up now. And that year, uh, Kevin Spacey won the Oscar for actor in a supporting role for The Usual Suspects. And he was up against James Cromwell from Babe, Ed Harris from Apollo 13, wait, 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 who I wait, thought wait. was Babe? fantastic. Babe. The, the Talking Pig movie? I don't know if it's the Talking Pig movie. I should check it out. Well, I really um, but also, know this. <laughs> <laughs> Brad Pitt from 12 Monkeys and oh. then Tim Roth from Rob Roy. Oh. So, I mean, a lot of real. Yeah, James Cromwell was the babe Talking Pig movie. Hey, that's a good movie. And We're Cromwell so- would have been the farmer, right? Yep. 
So, I mean, I, I guess I don't know. Oscar worthy, uh, Oscar nomination. I think his best uh, competition that year would have been Ed Harris. Ed Harris's yeah. performance in Apollo thirteen was stupid good. And then, I mean, for writing, it, it was up against the likes of like Braveheart, right? Really? And, what else? So yeah. Braveheart. We got Braveheart. We got Nixon. Okay. And Toy Story. Oh. Right. Really? So it's so odd to think about that Toy Story was that year. But yeah, it's I mean, it's it's right up there. So I think that it just shows that people I don't know. You gotta play to your audience, right? And we're thinking that we're nineteen ninety five. Braveheart gets so much critical it is so critically acclaimed and then if you were to go and pull a you know a group of people now and any age and you ask them which movie uh do they know more people would know braveheart than usual suspects yeah absolutely and like i said at the start of the show the fact that it won any academy award surprised me because watching the usual suspects is not me sitting down with my artsy fartsy glasses and my notebook you know trying to see all the symbolism and the filming and ooh, what are we what kind of artistic color scheme are we going for to elicit the emotion that we want it it's like you said earlier it's kind of a, a campy film in a way it's very 90s the colors are bright it could have been a comedy if it wanted because it's very lighthearted. it's nowhere near as serious as something like the godfather or uh, Scarface. It it has fun. The characters are having fun kind of a thing. And even Benicio Del Toro, the fact that his, he was allowed to get away with not being able to understand this entire film really speaks to that freedom that they were allowed, the, the breathing room they had versus a more serious film where I think it's, you know, very cut and dry. You either do this or get out kind of a thing. Yeah, I really enjoyed Benicio del Toro's performance. He he might be one of my favorite uh, performances in the film. It's just he feels really odd in every role that the, he does. I mean, and this is just a different kind of odd. And I I had forgotten what it felt like, and it it was very good. He he did a great job. And you know, talk talking about the writing all together for this film. It's got some great one-liners, right? I mean, the film basically opens up with lines, you know, uh, talking about, you know, the restaurant that the main bad guy wants to open up. And he's saying that the atmosphere will not be painted on the walls, talking about this restaurant, right? And it just sets the movie up for this might not be what you think it's going to be. Yeah, exactly. And we even have that wonderful line that's repeated about uh, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. So, yeah, from the beginning, we're we're told that it's going to be a lot of talking, which was something I think it was panned for, which surprised me because with how short the film is, I didn't feel like there was a lot of talking. It, it, it's a drama, right? You set up a lot of the stuff through words rather than actions. Absolutely. And and that's why I wrote down here that I was going to ask you if you think that the, this could be a stage play, like if you could do it as a stage play where it had one set and it was Kevin Spacey and the detective just talking, you know, that they're basically explaining the entire story inside of this, you know, detective's office. But then you could have something happening downstage of them like reenacting things that had happened during the during the show and i i think it would be really great right you cut the you cut the stage in half and you have the one section that's partitioned specifically for kevin spacey and the detective and then the other half that's for the actors acting out the story that we're being told and we even see that with the the story told of Kaiser Soze and what happened with his family kind of a thing. And that was the weirdest part of the movie. That was the one part of the movie that I felt kind of stuck out like a sore thumb because we go into that 90s slow-mo, but you can see where your hand was kind of a thing. And it's just so weird. <laughs> Yeah, you're suddenly in GoldenEye 64 and you're like in slow motion. And for some, I, I think they absolutely, I think they could have done away with that little flashback right there. They could have just had 
uh, Kevin Spacey's character tell the story of what would have happened and it would have been more powerful than, you know, us seeing this, you know, super over the top uh, melodramatic soap opera flashback of Kaiser Sose choosing to kill his family and kill the people that are, you know, uh, holding his family hostage. Yeah, we could have skipped it. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, he tells the story anyway. So so maybe that's why it felt weird ultimately is because every time we go into a flashback, we get a little bit of the narration and then we're left to follow the flashback itself. But with this, he just tells the whole story and it's there the whole time as he's telling it. And you're right. Ke- Spacey does such a great job telling the story that why would we pull away from his performance to see this weird not fairy tale. Maybe they could have animated it like the Harry Potter series when they told the tale of the three brothers. That is such a great part of that film. I'm not a huge fan. Okay. Save, save your direct messages and tweets email of the us. Harry Potter <laughs> <and emails, laughs> uh, of the Harry Potter film franchise. I think that movie specifically, the one where they explain the Deathly Hollows, it's like the second to the last one, right? Yeah. That that one is so incredibly slow. But I think that that part right there is so well done where they're t- where Hermione is telling the story of the Deathly Hollows, and they did that animated, you know, sequence to show what had happened. And the art style is awesome. It's, it's just a really cool part. Anyway, usual yeah. suspects. It's fantastic. <laughs> no, I agree. It's great. So maybe they could have done that and it would have been OK. But I don't know. I don't know. So on subsequent viewings, this is one of those films, I think, like Airplane. Airplane is one of those movies I'll watch again and I'll notice something I never noticed before, like a chicken wing or ice cream instead of a microphone kind of a thing. Uh, But, you know, less comedy with that. So were there things that you picked up the second time through that you were like, oh, great, this is awesome. Fun director clearly thought through what he was going to direct. Yeah, I mean, there's like you said, there's a lot of that stuff that's playing through. I did notice, you know, they're speaking of the lighter and the the moment where he uh, fumbles with the lighter. Right. Then there's a scene later where they take uh, Kaiser Sose's lawyer and they kill the two guys in the elevator. Right. And then they they bring him out and it shows Kevin Spacey's character lighting a cigarette, but just doing it perfectly fine. And that's the thing that I saw this time that I watched it. And I was like, uh, I was like, maybe they're doing that on purpose to show you to kind of have this little bit of like foreshadowing into the fact that that could be Kaiser Sose, but you don't notice it the first time you watch it. Yeah, totally. I enjoyed, uh, I was listening to the lines he was saying, like talking about the writing being all on the wall. He literally says what he's getting his stuff from. And the fact that Soze is sticking his neck out and was so close kind of a thing. Or uh, watching his body language in the detective's office. Because he very clearly looks specifically at things. The bottom of the coffee mug. The bulletin board as he's studying it to pull his stories. It's so great. And I love the fact that he even taunts the detective. Um that I'm smarter than you kind of a thing. And the detective totally doesn't buy it. But as soon as the name Soze happens and he busts in the room, who's Soze and Spacey goes, Oh bleep. He has the detective. He has the total trust of this guy and can now tell that story in whatever way he wants to. Absolutely. And, and just poking fun at the detective with the whole thing about, you know, uh, what was it? The quartet in uh, Illinois or whatever, when he was talking about that, that's just because that was the name of the whiteboard in the background and stuff. I mean, it's very smart. It's very, uh, very well done. That's the stuff that you don't know is happening when you watch it the first time. Even if you're kind of like, well, maybe this is the bad guy. You don't know that he's making this stuff up because of the stuff that is on the back wall, which is a cool little uh, icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. And yeah, kind of using the power of the good guy against him to get out, which was wonderful. Now, um, this film was, I guess not famously, but very very much panned by Ebert when he first saw it. He gave it one and a half stars. And his main motivation for that was that he didn't enjoy manipulation, which I think the script does. It's trying to force you to think one way and then going, oh, just kidding. It's actually this. And then found that there was much less substance to the tale than the movie would actually, that the movie, 
let me rephrase that. They, he, they, he found that there was much less substance to the tale being told than the movie implies itself. So that we're told that this story is elaborate, there's a lot going on, but when you actually get to the basic plot points, it's pretty simple and straightforward. What are your thoughts on that? I definitely agree with the first part. I definitely feel like the audience is, you know, being led along this path, you know, follow us, follow us. Don't, don't stray. Don't think anything different. Just follow us so that at the end we can really blow your mind. You know, I, I do feel like that, but I also feel that way about almost all of the films that have these, you know, surprise endings at the end, you know, something happens and this person is not exactly who you thought it was, or, you know, this, this sort of thing happens at the end. There are a few examples of that, that I actually think where, you're allowed to allow your mind to wander because the film is so confident that you won't think of what is going to happen at the end of this movie. Right. And the first example that I can think of that off the top of my head um, is the road to perdition. Have you seen that? No, actually I haven't, but that's Tom Hanks, right? That's Tom Hanks. Yeah. I'm not, uh, I'm going to spoil it for you because I, I need to spoil it. To yeah. Make yeah. My go point. for it. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> or else it's we'll my just be fault for it. not having seen Road to Perdition by this <laughs> point. Let me look it's up. Act- you know, it's it's a few years too late. It's actually really, really good. It's got Paul Newman in it. It's really good. So 2002. Um, so we're well beyond spoilers at this point. Okay. Um. Anyway, so there's a hitman that's sent after this mobster who's trying to run away with his son, right? And they're running and they're running and they're running. And in the middle of the movie... The hitman kills or no, the mobster who's Tom Hanks kills the hitman, whatever. That whole thing happens and the movie just moves on. It's like in the middle of the film that that happens. Really? Then at the very end where the movie has completely departed from that storyline, not even close to where, you know, it's going on and on and on and on. You're allowed to think whatever you want. Right. At the very end, when you think the entire movie is done and he's standing there with his son at the beach and it's literally credits are about to roll. He gets shot from behind and it's the hitman from behind. So it's things like that, that I actually find more intriguing where I'm allowed to think what I want with Ebert's review here. I kind of agree with that. The second, the second piece of his review though, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure I agree with it. I actually think that the, um, the story is being hindered by the film in a way where uh, there is more substance to the story than the movie is able to convey to the person that's watching it. And I think Ebert is saying the opposite of that. I think that it's just really hard with flashbacks and everything that's happening, you know, to really lay the groundwork. And that's where we see the difference in films and TV and books and, you know, all these differences. People, oh, I like the book. It set it up so much better. Yeah, but the book is like a 45 hour read and the movie is an hour and 45 minutes, you know? So I, I don't know if I agree with that second part, but the first part, Definitely. Yeah. And I think the the story issue definitely ties to that whole question of how do you tell a story in a nonlinear fashion so that it still makes any lick of sense by the end? Because by the end of this movie, the first time I watched it, I was confused that Soze was actually a real person because the we, when we come across Soze, he's a myth. He's a legend. He's a boogeyman told to scare thieves in the underground because he's just so evil that possibly. So I thought Soze was a made up thing and the twist was going to be something else. And I was very confused when it turns out Soze is actually real and he never wanted to open the first place. He just wanted to kill somebody that could identify him. Yeah. And how would you have felt if the movie ended with the first twist? Right. Because it twists Mm. one way where Kevin Spacey is led to believe that, you know, this guy that was an ex criminal that, you know, had killed a ton of people in jail and all this stuff turns out to be so say in the end. Would that have been enough for you to be like, oh, it was that guy all along. And maybe he's just alive floating around out there. Then maybe when Kevin Spacey walks out of the police department, that guy drives by in sunglasses and like looks at him and just drives off. And Kevin Spacey, you were left not knowing whether Sose ends up killing Kevin Spacey's character or not. 
Yeah, exactly. I would have. I think I would have been okay with that. Um, but I guess too, there is this open-ended question at the end that I've just realized: is Sozo went to so much work to have the single person who could identify him killed, but now the police department has a sketch of him because of a person who survived the explosion on the ship. Is he going to get a haircut? Is that what's going to happen now? Because that haircut's pretty defining. The face didn't look like Kevin's face at all, but it was the haircut. Yeah, that's a widow's peak if I've ever seen one. Man, he needs a haircut in that movie. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a, I didn't even think of that. That's a really great point. I mean, he went through all of this maybe just to to do that, but also get back at the cops. I don't know. Like there's gotta be something maybe we're missing. I don't know, but you're right. Why would he go through all of that to kill that guy? Why would he put himself in that position? If he was so powerful, he could just have other people go and do it for him. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing. Yeah. And maybe it's one of those he's bored or something. He's so powerful. He wants to feel the thrill of the chase again, kind of a thing, but who knows? So going back to Keaton, who's a very, very fun character, very believable. He wants to apparently, accordingly, according to the tale, take vengeance on the cops because he was almost out. He was going to open that restaurant with all of that wonderful atmosphere. But then he gets called in for the lineup and his uh, the investors, I believe, find out about it. And everyone's starting to pull out as he tells this uh, lawyer girlfriend that he has. And I just want to get your thoughts on this lawyer girlfriend, because she's not a prominent character, but at the same time, she's placed in very prominent situations throughout the story. We see him. Is he going to say goodbye to her? Is he not? She might be murdered if they try and kill Soze's associate, Kobayashi. That kind of a kind of a thing. Yeah, I do think the film lacks a little bit of setting that up for us. You know, it really just throws us into the deep end at the start of the film where Keaton and his, you know, lawyer, girlfriend slash wife, whatever it is, are, you know, in love and actually in love. And, you know, it's something that he is not willing to sacrifice to, uh, stop you know he, he he sees her and he thinks that if i don't do this then they're gonna kill her and i'm not sure that they convey that to us as well as you know he actually has to do this you know sort of thing it's kind of glazed over a little bit and kind of haphazardly brought up in my opinion but they needed to motivate him right because the other motivations that kobayashi says to the guys feel even worse right like hey i'm gonna go and get your uncle in arizona and i'm gonna go do this and that and this and the other thing and you're just like i don't care about any of that stuff like i, I don't care about any of it but i do care more about keaton's girlfriend than i do about those other things because of that yeah and she seems like a pretty decent person but in the end she ends up dead anyway According to the detective. So I just wonder, it's, I'm just imagining the usual suspects too. Is it Soze comes back but kills everybody who's seen the drawing and it's just a total murder Blood spree? <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's the biggest twist ever. It's insane. John Wick 3. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what, that's what we're moving on to. It's, it's really good. Uh, now of all of the gangsters, who did you like the most? I guess I really like Fenster, right? I mean, I really like Benicio Del Toro's character because he's kind of just weird. I mean, they're all weird. Uh, Stephen Baldwin's performance was just meh to me. And then Kevin Pollock is just meh to me uh, in some of the places. I mean, they're great. They're good. I mean, we're comparing, you know, you know, An Academy Red Apples. Award winning performance. <laughs> Yeah, really. I mean, we're, we're really, you know, it's it's hard. But um, I think Benicio Del Toro is one that I, I, I lean on the most. What about you? Mm, yeah, he was. He was really fun. But I really like the uh, Keaton, the, the innocence, because he's not an innocent character by any means. But he clearly doesn't want to get wrapped up in this again. And even with, so they go for the heist. They... Uh, I'm going to shoot you if you don't give me the briefcase. And the guy refuses to give the briefcase. So we see another instance of 
Kevin Spacey's character firing with his left hand with no shaking, no any kind of mishap, straight shot in the head. So so Keaton doesn't even kill anybody at this point. Only by the time do we get to the boat is he murdering people, but that's because apparently Soze's coming after him if he doesn't do it. Yeah, and that's another good thing to bring up, right? Because that's another thing that's kind of forced down our throat as viewers of this, where... At the beginning, they're setting the scene where we are to believe we got to figure out who that guy is that killed Keaton on the boat because they didn't show us. So we got to figure that out. And then what they do is they take all of these other gangsters and they give them all the same traits as the person that killed that person on the boat. Like, for example, shooting the gun sideways. Right. So if you're watching the movie, all of the gangsters at one point in the film, shoot their gun sideways because we don't want to give away anything, right? So we're going to make them all shoot their gun sideways, right? So that's another thing that I noticed as going through going through this again is, man, they're really trying to keep that secret safe. Yeah, and there's a, I was reading through the trivia on IMDb. Apparently the director convinced all of the main gangsters that they were Kaiser Soze. And and as the story goes, Gabriel Byrne, who played Keaton, was so convinced that he was Soze that when he finally saw the film and he wasn't Soze, he had some angry words with the director about it. They had a a talk at the end because he was so upset that he wasn't Soze. (laughs) That's amazing, right? That's amazing. I, I love stories like that because, I mean, he even filmed scenes as Soze, right, at the end of the movie. That actor is filming scenes like he's actually the bad guy at the end. I mean, that's that's what gives you the performance that you really want, because this guy's believing it and the audience is believing it, too. Exactly. Now, in that situation, would you have felt betrayed enough to go angrily talk to the director or would you have been like, whoa, whoa, he got me. He got me. That's so great. I didn't even know. No one could spoil this for me. I would have been that that end of it. But, you know, then again, I'm not, you know, a millionaire actor who, in Hollywood, you know, having mimosas on a Monday morning at 1130. That's a very good point. So, so as a millionaire actor, you'd have mimosas. <laughs> I'd have a couple of mimosas every day. Let's start our day out the right way. <laughs> I feel like that should be a breakfast cereal. Mimosas, start your day, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're on to something here, Kristen. It's so good. All right, so the lineup, the very, very start of the movie, uh, the as the behind-the-scenes talks went, the guys were having so much fun with that that they couldn't do the scene seriously. They went through so many takes, but everyone was just having too much fun. And the actors even took pay cuts to act in this movie because they all wanted to work together and work on this really cool story. And the director, Brian Singer, was very, very upset that they wouldn't take it seriously, but eventually just capitulated and weaved together a decently serious but altogether uh, fun lineup. How do you think that affected the setup to the movie itself? Do you think it kind of pushed it in a direction maybe the director wasn't thinking? Do you think it stands out at all? Yeah, I think that, you know, from what I've heard and from what I know, um, movie directors are, are, you know, really going into things with a set idea of what they what they want. Right. But it's the best movie directors that allow things to just organically happen. I think we talked about this before, but it's more like the director is helping the actor accomplish what they think, what the actor thinks this character is not giving them line readings and telling the actor what their character is, right? They're helping them discover it because then that creates the most organic interactions, personalities. You know, these are actual people that are feeling these things rather than being told what to say. And I think that really stands out in this movie in that lineup scene, because there's one part where Benicio del Toro's character is reading reading the line that they're all supposed to read. And you can tell that there is a genuine like humor reaction. It's so genuine at that moment. It's probably the most believable part of the entire film because it's real. 
Like these guys are actually just standing up there and they have to read this stupid line and they feel like it's stupid, just like the criminals would. And they're up there and he's got this funny accent and people are just listening to each other and having a, you know, a genuine, a genuine response to what's happening. And it's great. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I mean, if you've done any acting, there's always, I mean, auditions, right? Everyone's up there saying the same line in the same order. And depending on how long you've been there, you might just start cracking jokes because what else are you going to do? You're bored. Everyone's bored. You're just trying to have fun. And the poor director (laughs) is just trying to get a line read. And here you go. Because apparently Del Toro kept farting during the the reading. And so, of course, after that, you're not going to take it seriously anymore. And all the guys, apparently Gabriel Byrne is a very serious actor. So the goal, of course, is to make the serious actor crack. If you can make that guy crack... Mm, you're set. You're good. That That's all you need. And you can just go finish the rest of the film seriously. <laughs> it's great. It sets up a perfect personality mashup between these guys. They did great with the casting. I think it was really spot on. Uh, it's just great. Mm-hmm. So that this brings us to a question. If you were the gangster, you've got which role would you actually fill and which role would you want to fill? Oh, I guess I'd be more like the guy of how can we I mean, because Kevin Spacey's character takes it to the next level when he's saying things like, how can we do this without injuring or killing anybody in the situation? Right. Like, what can we use to make that happen? We can plan it out. I think I'd probably be more on that end. That's that's the role I would actually fill. But I would definitely want to be the Keaton kind of, you know, like leader, like you need me to get this job done. Like you can you can't do it without me. But really, I'm not that bad. At fantastic. Fantastic. I always I know I'd be the little short one with the temper because everyone would joke about me being short, and unable to do stuff. But I just oh, it would fill me with such rage that I'd come out doing it all the time. But really, I just want to be the suave one. That's the talker. Exactly. That's that's what I'm saying, too. Right. Like the Keaton of this whole thing, like the, you know, the whole, you know, uh, yeah, suave and talking and, you know, like important in quotations. Exactly. Now you have a note here. Smash it and pull out a windshield. <laughs> yeah, I wrote that down when I was watching this. I was like, man, there are some things that happens and happen in movies that you can really just suspend belief. But there was a sec- there was a part in this where they they do that that thing that we were just talking about where they're you know they plan to disrupt the uh, New York uh, police taxi company or whatever. And then Alec Baldwin or not Alec Baldwin, his One brother of the Baldwins. Stephen Baldwin um, jumps up on the police car, smashes the the windshield in with a um, sledgehammer like two or three times. Then he reaches in and rips the windshield off with one hand. I just write that down because sometimes I think, man, (laughs) this guy is a lot stronger than I thought he was. Have you ever ripped a, taken a windshield out? Because I guess the question is, how heavy is that? Because that's a lot of glass. Yeah, it's heavy. And it's also like uh, there's adhesive that attaches it to the car. I mean, it, don't get me wrong. I'm the first person that goes into a Marvel movie or goes into, you know, whatever movie and can just totally let go. But when you're in a movie like The Usual Suspects, you start thinking, Okay, I was on board because it took two or three times to smash that windshield. And that would probably be real, right? I mean, you're not just going to go in there with one smash and the stage glass is going to go everywhere. But uh, when he ripped it out, uh, it just took it a little bit too far for me, Kristen. That's funny. So what what's the line then with movies where <laughs> it's real and you take into account the reality of physics and and what we know about how things actually work versus when it goes into fantasy and you can blow up cars with a punch. I think it really just depends on the subject matter, right? I mean, you watch a movie like John Wick and the subject matter there is this guy is an all out assassin, but it's got this comic book feel to it. So if John Wick reached in and pulled out a windshield, I wouldn't be talking about it at all. I probably wouldn't even notice it or care, right? But this is taking a more like, 
I can't believe I'm saying this, but like a more realistic approach to how gangsters might operate in the world. And, you know, and this is just like a normal guy kind of thing. So I guess it depends on the subject matter, but it's just a stupid little pet peeve that I saw. No, dude, this is a great conversation because at what point is John Wick comic book versus um, usual suspects being reality, right? Because with usual suspects, we don't have a secret league of assassins. And maybe that's what it is. But at the same time, we don't see that league of assassins right from the start in John Wick. That's kind of a later thing that we come across. For all we know, he's just an ex-mafioso, ex-servant of the mafia, which is Rick Godfather, right? True. But, I guess it's just the feel. I get, you're right. Yeah. I don't even know that. Yeah, that's a cool conversation. Because how how do you pull that off and make it work? <laughs> but yeah, I agree with you. And I think the older we get, the harder it is to buy into mistakes that are made in realistically set movies because we've experienced Absolutely. more, right? So you having you seeing that windshield, you're like, there's no way I. What it what who who made this call? Get him out of here. Absolutely. And then I man, I sometimes wish I could just watch a movie, but I sometimes I can't. And, it, and there was a scene in this, too, where uh, the Baldwin brother is standing on top of the elevator. Yes. And he shoots the two guards from on top of the elevator. But the way that the, the, the film is shot is that the blood it hits the back of the elevator as if they were being shot from the front, but they're being shot from above. And I thought, wow, that, that I saw that. Like I shouldn't, but I'm looking <laughs> for it. Normal you. people aren't looking for it. I'm looking for stuff. Hey, that reminds me. I should tell you this because I thought it was really neat. When you watch a movie on Amazon Prime, mm-hmm. this is something I found, and you watch it on your computer. If you watch it on your computer and you just have like the uh, if you move the mouse or found them find the mouse like active during the watching of the film, it shows all of the actors that are in that scene. You can click on it and it'll take you to a different page and give you like their their bio and information on it. Not only that, though, but it also tells you interesting facts and trivia about the scene that you're watching. So somebody took some serious time to put all of this stuff into Amazon Prime. So if you're a movie buff like us and you want to see that kind of stuff, because that's how I know this fact that Alec Baldwin was act or Stephen Baldwin. Alec Baldwin was not in this movie. That's a fun (laughs) fact. Second fact, Stephen Baldwin was not available to film that scene because he broke his shoulder doing some other scene in a film or in a TV series. So they had to shoot his portion of that from above the elevator in a parking lot at a later date and maybe that's why i'm kind of like jumbling my brain up maybe that's why there's a weird continuity flaw there but hey amazon prime video this show isn't sponsored by it but but check it it out (laughs) that's awesome because i'm always i've got my phone with imdb up and i'm reading about the the trivia behind it Me too. me too it's so much fun all right, and then so if we were to choose an actor who was going to play Kaiser Soze, verbal Flint Kint Flint, oh dear, uh, verbal. I think, yeah, verbal. That's I think it's Kint, but I'm not sure. Who who would you who would you like to see in this role? So I wrote down two. I'm looking at yours, and yours are really, really better than mine. What? No, but, these uh, are all really good. I like Eddie Redmayne. I really like it. Yeah. I think he's a really good actor. And I I think he might be too young. Maybe that's just because I just saw Fantastic Beasts, which if you haven't seen the second Fantastic Beasts, save your, save your money. But um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, he's great in that. And I think he would be great in this. And then I also like Edward. Probably because he falls in that whole like fight club thing. And that kind of falls into what we're talking about here. I like those two guys. What do you think? Yeah. And I mean, Edward Norton could pull off the hair. Eddie Redmayne, you'd need to shave or put a wig on to do that hair. (laughs) But I think Norton could pull that off. No problem. Um, And the guys that I chose would be strictly because I'd want to see what their interpretation of Soze would be. Uh, Christoph Waltz. 
I, just so good. because I've only seen him in wacky roles, I'd really like to see him in a very kind of subdued Boy Scout with a heart of coal kind of a thing. Going oh, absolutely. On. I, I love this suggestion. I think he might be, this is a bold statement, but I think he might be like in that age range, top five uh, actors working right now. I mean, I think he is in incredible i mean we talked about him when we talked about inglorious bastards on like episode four of this show he's incredibly talented and really good great pick yeah and i think what really sells him for me i'm his intensity this man sees it he sees these emotions and his face is just so expressive and how quickly he can go from happy to seer to scary in a second Oh my god! Oh my god! Yeah, he could play. He could play any role in that film. I think he would fit really well. Like, imagine if he was the detective that was really trying to get the information out of this guy. Like, you would really believe it. Oh, he's such a good actor. Mm. Yes, a plus choice. I love it. And then Gary Oldman, just because Gary Oldman is my favorite character actor. He is he. If I were an actor, I would want to be the female Gary Oldman because you don't need to star in anything. You just get roles because you change your let your accent, your appearance. You're having fun with everything you do. Uh, yeah, he's he's great too. You really like Gary Oldman, Kristen. We've talked about yeah. this before. I think it's definitely merited. He is so good. <laughs> I mean, in Batman, let's be real. Like, let's take it down. Let's break it down all the way to a superhero comic book movie. Gary Oldman is legit. He is on point. And of course, it's one of those. You, you look at him and you go, I know that guy. Who is that guy? that Gary Oldman? See, he's so muted. His performance is so muted. He really lets the other actors shine. But then you go see one of my favorite campy films, Dracula. <laughs> yeah, we've talked about With this Keanu before, Reeves. too. We're going to have to watch that <laughs> soon, I think. But his performance as Dracula is amazing. It's so over the top. And oddly, like, sexual, but I don't see Gary Oldman as being a romancer of sorts. And then you go to um, the one with Bruce Willis, Fifth Element, and yeah. there's a weird character there. He's all over the place. And then The Darkest Hour, his most recent uh, deal that he did. I mean, he, he's he's great. Man, your picks are way better than mine. I totally agree. I think they fit the age uh, the age comparison a little better than my picks do. I, I mean, Eddie Redmayne and Edward Norton could fall in the gang, right? Like maybe they're, you know, some of the gang members. Maybe Edward Norton is the Baldwin brother and Eddie Redmayne kind of fills in maybe even Benicio Del Toro's role, like a weird, you know, kind of thing. But yeah, great, but great no, man, casting there. physically and I think actor level wise would do the best to really take on a serious Soze, like a, a very good reinterpretation, Academy Award winning levels, even. So, yeah. And, and another thing I learned from uh, Amazon Prime as I was watching it is that Kevin Spacey actually went through and met with, I think it said 10, somewhere around 10 doctors and physicians and people that had cerebral palsy to kind of figure out exactly what the challenges were. And anytime he was on set, he was trying to put himself in those shoes so that he could see uh, what it felt like and what the challenges would be if it was someone that was actually, you know, affected by this disease. And it was, I mean... It's cool. That kind of stuff really does shine through when the actors do their research. Um, if you've never seen uh, Ian McKellen's Richard the oh. Third, his physical training is is unlike anything I've ever seen because he plays Richard. Uh, Richard doesn't have use of one. I think his right side, maybe his left side, but either way, he does everything one handed. And I, I don't even know how long he trained how to do this stuff seamlessly, but it's oh, my God. Yeah, one of the best actors of all time. And and speaking of training, uh, Kristen and I have watched these films on YouTube. You can watch them. They're actually a series put out by Wired, the um, the magazine, where they bring in a dialect coach for these films for um, for Hollywood. And the dialect coach an, 
analyzes all of these dialects that are happening in films. And I highly recommend watching it because it talks about how much training effort, time, and all of these types of things to something that we can just critique in, you know, two seconds. We watch a film like uh, Blood Diamond and we see uh, Leonardo DiCaprio trying to do a South African accent and we think that sounds really bad. But the amount of time that it takes to get into that, and do all that stuff. If you're a lover of movies, you got to watch that series on YouTube, Wired, Dialects. It's awesome. Yeah, and try it out yourself. Practice dialects at home because it's not as easy as you would think. And South African is definitely one of those accents that I would need at least five years to even get close. Seriously, and living there and, you know, just, and so it gives you a different appreciation for people that uh, can do dialects well. Exactly, that they can act naturally enough while having that dialect that you don't even know it's not their natural way of speaking. Yeah, absolutely. So if you like this film, I think we both put together a collection of films with twists at the end <laughs> because yep. that's really what this is. Uh, Memento is a classic. Again, that one's a very nonlinear story, so you won't really know what's going on until the end. The Game is a really fun one. Uh, it's not a masterpiece, but if you like, um, who is it? Oh, gosh, what's his name? He's, like, super popular. Um, Let's see. Michael Douglas. If you like Michael Douglas, watch the game if you haven't seen it. Fight Club, of course, classic one. And then the others, if you're in for a little spooky tale with a twist at the end. All those movies are fun to watch. They're great to kind of just turn your turn your brain off and just go with the story. I mean, it's it's really good. Same thing for my my suggestions, right? Gone Girl, if you haven't seen that. Surprisingly, I really liked it. So check it out. There's a twist at the end of that one. The Departed, which we've spent a ton of time talking about. It's just a fun movie. Less twist and more of this whole crime, you know, kind of realistic uh, crime deal. Seven is a movie that I put on here because Kevin Spacey is also in that film and uh, it's got an interesting uh, story to tell. It's also scary and like it's not it's happy. Yeah, not happy. <laughs> yeah. So don't watch that when you're looking to uh, feel good. <laughs> be in the holiday mood don't watch seven unless it's halloween then maybe and then i wrote down here the prestige which i love the prestige i think it's so good and you gotta watch it that's all i'm gonna say if you haven't seen it watch the prestige and let me just say christian bale's performance if you watch it his subtleties he does he nailed you know you know which one it is yeah it's great ah! it's and that feeds into everything that we talked about with the usual suspects. I think the prestige might be the next movie you should watch out there. If you're looking for something that kind of falls in the same, same kind of subject matter in a way, but also it's got this whole fantasy aspect of it. And Hugh Jackman is awesome as always in the movie and, and like false Kristen endings, said, right? Yep. Fault, lots of false endings. So if you like false it's endings, <laughs> <laughs> so, Jeff, will the usual suspects stand the test of time? You know, I'm not sure on this one. I, that's what I wrote down in my notes here, only because I feel as though it's going to feel dated at some point. Already right now, I watched the movie and it feels dated. So that's a that's a red flag to me on whether it will stand the test of time. The parts of it, like we talk about every week, these good movies that we talk about every week, the performances, the writing, all of these types of things will keep this movie living on because film students and people that are studying film are looking at these types of things. Things I think it will hinder it is the... You know, the style of the film is very set in one specific decade. It feels like this one, you know, this one time period type of thing, even though the movie's telling you present day, that kind of hurts films, in my opinion. And so I think that the the technical aspects of this movie will stand the test of time. Kevin Spacey's performance, the writing the fact that it's like a cult classic now will keep it living for a while. But what happens in 40 years when there are kids watching this movie and doing a podcast about it and they're saying, I wasn't around in the 90s. I have no nostalgia about the 90s. This movie just looks bad to me. 
Yeah, and to that point, how many 90s movies will they have watched to actually know where this kind of fits in, as it were? But that's a great point, right? Because I will <laughs> Twister, I think, is a 90s movie that's going to be one of the best monster movies. The script's great. The story's great. The monster's the force of nature, but it's done well. There's a good comedy and energy there. But it doesn't have this kind of filming technique to it. At yeah, all. absolutely agree. And that's the first time I've ever heard that about Twister. And that is a <laughs> great description of that. You're genius. Yeah, when we go, when we hit Twister, and we will hit Twister at some point, watch it and think of it as a monster movie. And it's one of the greatest monster movies ever made. It's it's hilarious. It's a D&D &D adventure in a sense. Because you've got your your F1 and people talk about the F5, but, you know, those are so rare. But then you see the, the F2, right? And then you get the sisters with the F3. And then, oh, my God, we didn't think it was going to happen, but there's an <laughs> F5. <laughs> it does exist. The big dragon that blows fire and kills everyone. Exactly. Nobody lives through an F5, but will our heroes who have been leveling through the Fs manage to survive it? We don't know. That's right. All they need is the legendary item, Dorothy. Dorothy. <laughs> <laughs> and Pepsi can. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and then we've done it. We've solved the tornado problem. <laughs> That's right. Any tornado that comes from now on. Uh, We've got enough be... science to stop you with prediction. <laughs> oh, that's great. All right. Oh, all right. So what's next, Jeff? Next up, we're watching my favorite holiday film, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. That's right. And you can watch it on Amazon Video so you can see all the cool trivia that we were talking about. I, I'm dying already. I, I find the jokes funny every time I watch this movie, even though I can quote it. Dude, I'm right there with you. We watch this every year, and I think my dad and I are always in tears when we get to the squirrel part. The squirrel part, and then when she can't blink because her eyes are frozen open, and the mom's just like, I don't think she can blink anymore, dear. Yeah, uh, she'll see it later, Clark. Her eyes are frozen. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Oh. oh, man, if you haven't seen this, you gotta, gotta, gotta watch it and make sure you have a spiked eggnog while you watch it. Mm hmm. The spiked eggnog is the best. And just remember, we all have these family members in our family. Oh, yeah, that's the challenge, Kristen, for this week. So the challenge for National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation is which character in the film do you identify with the most? Which one do you think you are? Because I already have an answer for myself, and I can't wait to talk about it. Oh, my God. Please be Chevy Chase. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to wait to find out. We're going to have to wait to find out. So if you want to share your thoughts about this film, best place to do that is on Twitter at TPACast. But you can also email us at TalkingPicturesAlliance at gmail.com. And we'll talk about it there. We got two weeks. Jeff, where can people find you in the meantime? They can find me on Twitter at Mr. Jeff Reynolds, where we're talking about a whole bunch of stuff. Oh, and heroic Gahoon. That's down. right. If you're a World of Warcraft player out there, we got heroic Gahoon down my guild. Oh, man, it, fe it felt so good. Now we moved on to Mythic and it doesn't feel as good. Oh, but it's, <laughs> you know, but you got that nice farm going on, right? So everyone's still getting gear and feels. That's feels right. Nice, it's a ton of fun. Awesome. If you want to find me, you can find me at underscore Kristen Ashton underscore Twitter, Twitch, and Instagram. And as for this show, you can find us right here on twitch.tv slash Kristen Ashton. I officially made the change, so it'll be a lot easier to find now. Every other Sunday, except for the next one, we will be here Saturday, December 15th instead to talk about National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation and I'm sure many Christmas memories that go along with it. Uh, and if you'd like to support this podcast, head on over to patreon.com slash tpacast. And with that, Jeff, any final words? And like that, he's gone.